Hello sweet friends, welcome back to the channel. If this is perhaps your first visit because you found me via the Costume Symposium, let me just say I'm so happy that you're here. My name is Laura Ingalls Gunn and I have loved Jane Austen for most of my life. I discovered the novel Sense and Sensibility when I was working as a student aide in the school library and I just fell in love with all the different characters. Now this is my second video of the Cause to Weekend. Yesterday I shared how to make Mrs. Dashwood's cap and I was joined by two of my friends it was a delightfully productive and funny time, so make sure uh, you tune into that as well. I will link down below in the description box to that video. So, Marianne Dashwood's ball gown, as worn by Kate Winslet in the 1995 film Sense and Sensibility. I remember going to see that film in the theaters and was completely enchanted and it has been on my must make list in the five years that I have been creating historical garments. And if you're new here, you may not be aware that 90% of what I make comes via elements that I find at estate sales and thrift stores. So I had found this beautiful diaphanous cross shot blue and gold silk at an estate sale about three years ago and I instantly knew that it would be perfect for Marianne's dress. Now it took me about another three years to find the other elements such as the antique lace trim that's on the edge of the gown and then she also has a jeweled embellishment and that was actually very tricky um, to replicate that. I got it as close as I could and so a about three months ago all the elements were in place and I knew I was going to be attending costume college and they were going to host a Pride, Prejudice and Zombies Ball. So I thought, well, it's close enough that that would be a perfect place to wear the dress. Because as costumers, I am sure that you can relate that we need that incentive of the event to get us sewing. Now since the silk was something that was just a random find and I would not be able to get any more of it, I wanted to familiarize myself in the making with the construction of a bib front gown and that is the style that Marianne wears and that I am also wearing right now. And so I selected a laughing moon pattern. I've made one other dress um, in a different style from laughing moon and it came out really nice. So uh, once my pattern was selected, I knew I wanted to make a mock-up to get all of the kinks out and when I make mock-ups, I try to, as best as I can, make them wearable mock-ups. So I have an event this coming November um, to give a class in which I am talking about Regency Gardening. And that's a series that I've been doing for about the past year but this is going to be an in-person lecture. And it is in a castle in Houston. I know that sounds a little bit strange, um, but 
the castle in November could possibly be very cold. So I wanted a heavier weight dress with long sleeves. So it was this, basically the same style of dress that I was going to make for Marianne's gown. I just wanted to change up the sleeves. So this is my wearable mock-up that I made. And in the next few segments, you will see how this dress came together. And then that nerve-wracking moment when I was finally ready to cut into my silk. Now, as Murphy's Law would have it, this dress actually went together really easily. The other dress, I, I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> It, it was so filled with mishaps. One of the biggest was that my lining piece for the bottom skirt, so it's like a long section of fabric, I lost it. I, I have cleaned my sewing room. I don't know what happened to it. And because the lining was also fabric that was vintage, it's a different color because I had to go match it with is what I could most closely find at my local fabric store. And the puffed sleeves were challenging. They didn't even quite come out to what I wanted. So I may redo them because I have some additional fabrics. So I may be doing that in the future. Um, so let's get started on how to make Marianne's ball gown. So after you have made your interior lining and exterior fabric, the next step is to sew the neckline together. Now because the lining piece goes all the way across in front, you will have some excess and it does ask you to iron down the edge of the exterior piece by a quarter of an inch. So I have just sewed it at the neckline and of course um, clipped the curves. All right, so you can see I have clipped about every inch or so both the lining and the exterior fabric all the way around the neckline. This just helps to make sure that the neckline lays down smoothly. The next step is to do understitching of the lining right alongside this seam. So that is what I'm doing right now and I will show you what it looks like when I'm finished. Okay, so you can see all the way around the neckline of the lining I have done under stitching. Now you can't see it on the exterior fabric. The next step is to sew the armhole lining and exterior fabric together. And I just start out by pinning and it's okay if the two edges do not meet up exactly because this is a half inch seam allowance, it's not gonna matter. So what, what matters is that this neckline edge is all smooth and you just push your fabric out and then pin and then sew all the way around the armhole. Now the next step is to fold the top of your interior lining piece down 5 eighths of an inch. That is the seam allowance. And then in half again. And you're going to be pressing this either with a finger press or with an iron all the way along the edging. Now when you get to that section where you have clipped it, to the neckline because that's where your bodice fabric starts. That is going to be a raw edge so you may want to treat that with some fray checks and now after you do this we are going to pin this edge down and top stitch it. 
we're ready to start working on the sleeves now. And per the instructions, they want you to run a gathering line from the two circles that are indicated on the pattern piece. Now, I always trace my pattern pieces, so I always make sure to place all of the indicator circles, diamonds, whatever they may be. And then I then mark it with a pen on the fabric itself. So when I'm sewing, I know where to start and I know where to stop. And so I'm just going to set my machine to the longest stitch. On the sleeve, you are going to have four different areas of gathering stitches. This is the elbow area, and that is on either side of the sleeve. And again, the markings are on the pattern itself. And then we have the front of the sleeve, and if you can kind of see where my tail is, and then you have a second set, which is the back of the sleeve. So it runs along the top of the arm scythe, but there is a starting and stopping point, basically kind of in the middle. I have been working on setting these sleeves for about six hours now. Now they say per the instructions that the back is eased in and most of the gathers are in the front. Once I get this on me, I have a touch of scoliosis. I also have rolled shoulders. They're not sitting really where they should be. Um, I'm hoping once the weight of the skirt is on, perhaps that will pull down because when I try it on my own self, I'm getting some wrinkling here. But as you can see on the mannequin, it's fine. So I think it's just me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move forward. I didn't finish off my seams or anything, so if worse comes to worse, I can take them off and start again, but I, I just want to move forward with this because I'm at the point now with these sleevels, I just want to set them on fire as one does when things are not easy. So, uh, it's been a challenge. So I decided to line my sleeves and add a small ruffle. And how you do this to get a clean finish is that the ruffle itself is a four inch strip that I just fold in half. And then that way you don't have a seam line and if you wave, it also gives a nice finish to your interior. And so once you have attached the ruffle, you then take your lining, and the lining is inside out, and the sleeve is right side out. So you put the sleeve inside of the lining, and then pin it and you're gonna sew all the way around. And then once you do that, you then just flip it inside out and that will give you a clean finish. I'm getting ready to put the markings on my fabric of where the back skirt needs to be pleated. Now, one of the things that they include is piece 16C, and it's basically an overlay. So I just make mine out of tracing paper, and then I just follow the measurements of putting it in the upper left-hand corner. And so that shows you where you need to start your pleating, where your slash line is gonna be, 
And once I attach my pattern once again to the fabric, I'm going to use a tracing wheel and tracing paper to create my markings. I have marked on my fabric where the indicator line is for the slash. Now, I'm never a big fan of slashing fabric because it always creates a weak point at the end of it. So I'm going to do something a little bit different. I've also heard from two other people that you do not need that long of a slash line. It can almost be between four and five inches if you are not big busted. Uh, if you are big busted, you may need the full size slash. But anyhow, I have created a strip of fabric that is hemmed on three sides and it was four and a half inches by two inches. And I just did a easy little fold over and then stitched it in place. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put right sides together on each side. I've, I've made two of these. We're going to work separately. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to sew this on in a V. And then I'm going to slash my fabric and then flip this inside out so that it is reinforced with double fabric. Now for those of you who are visual learners, don't worry, I'll, I'll share the next step uh, once I first sew it on in a V and then cut the center down. I don't know if you can see, but there's my stitch line and I put some indicator pins that I knew to come to a point right down here. So it was like an extra long V. And then I took my scissors and then I made the slash. And so next, we're gonna fold this out, press it, and then turn it back in so that it is a reinforced slash. I have double the fabric so it will be stronger and I won't have a wardrobe malfunction of the slash possibly tearing down further into the skirt. I ironed the piece out and tucked it in. So this is now what it's going to look like on the outside. And then I'll flip it back over. So this is what it looks like on the interior. Now, my next step, just for one more added insurance for reinforcement, is I'm going to do a tiny stitch right along this edge. And then when I turn, I'm going to go back and forth a couple of times, and then a tiny stitch down this side. So then I've got two layers of fabric and reinforced stitching. Is this historically accurate? I don't know, but you know, when you're putting this much time into a garment, you don't want it to rip after the first wearing. And I have had friends who have made this dress and especially if it is a lightweight a cotton voile or a delicate silk, it can easily rip right through your slash mark on just single fabric. So this is just insurance. You don't have to do it this way. This is just how I'm doing it. I think I finally have my sewing mojo back. It's been a rough couple of days with those sleeves, but I have to say this pattern does an excellent job in indicating where you need to pleat the skirt. And then after you pleat it, 
you sew up the back seam. And look at that pattern matching that I did. I mean, that is pretty darn close on that back seam. Now, when I'm standing up in this dress, the pleats will cover it, but I'll know they're there. I attached the back of the skirt to the back of the bodice just with the exterior fabric and now I have smoothed down the bodice lining and folded it over, pinned it, and now I'm going to hand sew it into place. I'm now getting ready to make the front bib portion and per the instructions I made a little channel and right in the dead center I've left and opening in the channel. So now I'm gonna thread some twill tape through it. And on one end, I always put a really big safety pin. So that way, if I get a little aggressive with pulling the twill tape through, I won't pull it all the way through. This'll stop me. All right, the gathering tape is in and you can see that by pulling it, it's going to give us that gathered bib front. The side seams have been sewn down and now I have run a gathering stitch and this bottom section I'm now going to join to the front of the skirt. I have finished my wearable mock-up and now I'm getting ready to cut out Marianne Dashwood's ball gown. And this is my beautiful silk. It's a cross shot of blue and gold, very diaphanous. And I can't get any more. Um, I found it years ago at, a, at an estate sale. So I wanted to be very careful and I've placed all of the pattern pieces out without pinning and I do have enough fabric. And my first piece that I'm going to cut is one of the back skirt pattern pieces. And on this one, I have attached a slight train to it because Marianne's dress does have that. I'm also cutting this with just a single layer of fabric. It's very slippery, um, so this will just ensure that it is accurate. And it does take a little bit more time um, as opposed to just doubling up the fabric. But again, I don't want to make any mistakes. And for silk like this, um, I know a lot of people like to use washers. What I do is I use silk pins. They're very thin, very sharp, and I just put them right along the edge of the pattern pieces. It does leave a hole, but since this is within my seam allowance, it's not going to matter. Because this fabric is so sheer, I am going to have to flat line all of the upper bodice pieces. And then I also needed an interior lining. So because of this, these three pieces, I actually had to cut out three times. And once you see how it goes together, it will make a little bit more sense. Now the remaining pieces, they all were just cut out once in the silk and then once in the lining. It's just the upper bodice pieces that need this. I have just finished pleating one side of the back of the gown. You can see how I made my slash mark again in the same manner. It's just a sturdier way of doing it that I prefer. And I went to go do the 
other half, the second piece, and I realized I had made a grave error. I sewed the two pieces of fabric, my lining and my silk fabric, the same way in which the first piece had done. So basically I now have two of the exact same pieces. Now luckily, because my fabric is the same on both sides, all I have to do is unpick all this stitching and flip it over so that it will be reverse. But man, that's a lot of extra work. Always, always, always measure twice, cut once. On Marianne's dress, I went back and forth with the sleeve construction. I know that the sleeve rests a little bit above the crook of the arm, and it blouses over slightly, especially when I superimposed uh, still photography, and there was some slight gathering. So what I did is I cut a 3 fourths inch sleeve from the pattern and then once it was stitched up I held it up to me to where I thought it looked similar to the photo. Then I just made a band and you can kind of see this is what the interior is going to look like. I'm going to need to hand stitch this one. I've already hand stitched that one closed. And for this, I just made it two inches wide and then the circumference of about my bicep area. So that's going to vary with each person, but it was two inches wide. I used a 5 8 inch seam allowance to sew it on the exterior. And then of course I'm hand finishing on the interior. I don't know if it's exactly what they did with Marianne's sleeve, but it does give me a look similar to what is shown. The body of the dress is finished. It still needs to be hemmed and trimmed. All of that is hand sewing. Right now, I am going to add the little tiny bit of lace that peeks through just at the top of the gown. This was probably a chemise, um, but for purposes for this dress, I'm just going to add a layer. So the first thing I'm going to do is hem the edges so they're finished and I'm going to do that with some matching thread. And then once both edges are hemmed, then I'm going to pin just to double check my measurement. Interestingly enough, this antique Edwardian lace, I had just enough of it and I'll be attaching it to the dress with this silk thread that I have been using to construct it. So my battery is about to die. I will go ahead and start these things and come back to show you my progress.
This dress requires quite a bit of hand sewing. I finished adding the lace all around the neckline and this is the interior piece that ties and that's you know where the lace is added and then the drop front covers it like this so the lace is not added here and sometimes it's helpful to blow up the images and then I even look at it with a magnifying glass and I could kind of see that where the drop front was that there was no lace attached to it and so once that was done I added hooks and eyes so to the corner of the interior of the drop front and the reason I did that is because in the photo you can see uh, that she has what is in essence um, gold wire ribbon it's antique gold wire ribbon now I didn't have that I looked I couldn't really find what I wanted but you know you take this and you can burn the edge with a match to keep it from fraying and then I just twisted it around the end here like this and then that gives you the look now putting this in my suitcase it will have to be redone right before I wear it and I mean over time I'll probably have to create new ones. These are just tacked on with three stitches and then I hand stitched some gold here. You can see that she has the detailing and in other images it only goes to the front of the waist. She has ties on the back and you can kind of see that she has a jeweled embellishment and you know I've been collecting supplies for this dress for about three years now and I had found this pendant at Hobby Lobby I think about two years ago and it was on clearance for a dollar seventy four and my husband was able to remove the rounded pendant portion that you would have then put on a chain um, and then he was able to sand that to give me the look that I wanted. Now it is heavy and I was worried about it pulling on the dress so there's actually a series of two pins one that's right on the edge to keep it from falling forward as well as in the middle and since that's right where it is gathered together with the skirt um, that's a nice thick piece so once I pin it on right here it should hold I'm, go I'm gonna try it on right now um, so now all of those fine little details done I'm ready to now start the hem but this was almost oh gosh by the time I get done with the hem it's it's going to be a full day of hand sewing I'm loving how the back of this dress is hanging I've had it on the dress form all night because I have to hem it and I do like how the front of the garment looks when I'm not wearing it however there's a little bit of a wardrobe malfunction I need to move the hook and eye down because right now it's pulling in a way that's not flattering 
And then over here on the side, these pleats, uh, you know, I sewed them as they were marked. I don't know if it's the fabric or my body type, which is pear shaped. It is not flattering at all. It's adding a lot of bulk. So I am going to take this seam out and try to rework this so that it's laying a bit more smoothly. Um, I have, as you can see, I've pressed them down. The pattern recommends that you press the fabric down. It may be the fabric, but this is not working for me. So, yes, yay, ripping out, love it. Yay, oh my goodness, it is finally done. This dress, although relatively simple in style, was a bit difficult. And after I show you the exterior images, we'll take a look on the inside, and that kind of tells the tale. When I put the pin on the dress, it sort of leaned forward. So my friend Michelle had the idea to Gorilla Glue some jump rings to the back of it and then I just stitched it on. So that worked really well. This is gold wired ribbon that make the little embellishments and you know they have to be redone. I just use a pencil to curl them. The Edwardian lace think looks lovely. The train to hem this to get it even. Oh my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. The back, oh, is my favorite part. Isn't it pretty? So right at the seam, I added some belt loops that you saw me working on on either side and that really helps to keep that bow right in place and ironing all these pleats on the silk train. The sleeves probably could have been a little bit longer, but given that the tea theme is Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies, this looks a little bit more like the dress in that movie, the sleeve length. I have extra fabric, so I can go ahead and make some different sleeves if I choose to do so. Really pleased how it turned out. Now, this is an antique necklace that I have. It's uh, not the same as the one Kate Winslet wears. Hers has opals, I believe, in the necklace, but I think it, it's a nice necklace to pair with it. And so now I will show you this is attached with hook and eyes. You can see that in the corner. So your traditional bib front gown. And then it has this panel that closes. Now my bust is a little bit bigger, so this should, the white lace should peek over the top. If not, I guess I can pin it in place to make it look more like it did in the film. And I'll go ahead and you can see that everything was lined. This fabric was so sheer and you can't really see the cross shot. I, I may have to take it outside for you. I don't know if it's just coming on camera, but the blue and gold warp and weft threads. It's just so pretty in person. So I'm going to stop the camera for a minute 
and flip the dress inside out. I think it always helps to see the interior construction of a dress, you know, because then you can really see all the details. So a little hem on this, and then it was tacked on by hand all the way around, and you can see the drawstring on the interior. And then let me go ahead and pin this up in place for you because then you can kind of see I do my opening different than what they recommend. So you can see how I did that. It's just sturdier. You know, you don't have the risk of it ripping because you have, you know, in this case, a triple layer of fabric now. And then that's sewn. Again, once you flip it inside, the hem on the sleeves was all hand done. And you know, completely lined. So that definitely made it a challenge. Um, I did use a serger to finish off this seam just because both of these fabrics fray horribly. I didn't do it on the sleeves because again, I might change these sleeves to be a little bit longer. I haven't decided. French seams on all the seams. Now the hem in the front is about a two inch hem and that goes down to about a half inch hem towards the back. And the reason why I gave such a generous hem in the front is if somebody else needs to wear this and they're taller, then we can let that out. And then you can kind of see all of the pleating in the back. And it was attached all by hand here. So yeah, this dress, even though a lot of it was done on the machine, there were several, several hours of hand stitching everything. You know, I am pretty particular about the interior finishes. I want to create a garment that's really going to last. If I'm going to take the time, I want to wear it until it is no longer wearable. So next up, packing it up to wear it to the tea at Costume College. enjoyed today's video as much as I enjoyed making it. Now in September I am going to be living out my Anne of Green Gables dreams. I have decided to make an Edwardian capsule wardrobe. So during the month of September 
I'll be making a walking suit, several blouses, another skirt, and because I can never get enough of the frilly good stuff, I'm thinking I might be able to sneak a ball gown in there too. So if that's of interest to you, I'd love for you to follow along. Just hit the subscribe button in the lower corner to be notified of upcoming videos. As always, I appreciate thumbs up and joyful comments that I receive. Let me know what you're working on or what your favorite aspect of historical fashion is. Thank you so much for watching. The other half, and I reel, and there's our grace.